Nick, um, first, before we even dive into anything, I just want to uh, ooh, kind of just show off this image. It was by, taken by Pablo Yanez. It was a drone image of my study area. And I just want to kind of start this give it a little bit of appreciation of the area to uh, kind of love the area as I've come to love it. Um, we have the James River as the water and it's flowing towards us in the picture, but it's flowing towards Williamsburg. And there's nice green foliage. Uh, it's kind of overcast, but that makes for beautiful pictures as you will see in a couple other images. And what's really important here is that the James River is doing something very, I wouldn't say unique, but it's very key to this. And it's uncovering these rocks. And some of these rocks are creating rapids and some of them have sediments on top of them. But this is kind of the focus of the thesis is that there's these rocks that are being exposed by the James. And that is what we're gonna take over. So now we can dive into the mystery of the Shores Melange. Now, before we go even further, let's go ahead and talk about the history of this. So in this image by Flansburg and Bailey, we have the opening and closing of several ocean um, basins. So the Iapetus is closed and then go on and then Atlantic open, and we have what we have today. Now, what I'm studying happened just a bit before there, and it's in this little image right here, and that is actually the Taconian orogeny, which occurred about 450 to 435 million years ago. And what is happening in this is that there is a volcanic arc that we know as the Chapawamzit volcanic arc, and is approaching the Laurentian margin. And in Virginia, this is kind of where it's closing the Iapetus Ocean, What's really key here is this nice little purple blob I have here is the accretionary wedge. And this is the scrape up of the sediment of the ocean crust and of course, of course erosion from the Chapawaza volcanic arc. There's this nice wedge that's getting pushed closer and closer and closer towards the passive Laurentian margin. And in there, there's this melange. Now, it'd probably be important for me to actually define what a melange is. And it's uh, French for basically to mix, it's a mixture. So it's a mixture of a bunch of different rocks. So you have these amafic to ultramafic oceanic crusts that form into like blocks. And it goes into the sedimentary rock and it gets mixed up. And it's just a big, long mixture, essentially. Um, eventually, the Chapawanza volcanic arc collides into the Laurentian margin and thrusts this melange and accretionary wedge on top of the Laurentian margin, which allows us to study it today. Now, Let's go into where the study area is. Of course, all these processes kind of built up what the uh, Piedmont is today. And the Piedmont is a very, well, we know it's rolling hills and it's kind of, it's not flat per se, but it's, I want to say boring, but it's the geology but underneath it and the bedrock is fantastic. So we have Laurentian terrains, which just means these aren't, they haven't really moved much. They've always been on the Laurentian. We have these exotic or suspect terrains as well. And these really build up the Piedmont to what it is today. and the suspect, suspect and exotic just simply means that they're not from Laurentia. We don't always know where they're from, and that's part of the whole mystery and the um, extravagance of studying these uh, areas. And my area is in this, where it's kind of labeled for right now, is a myelinite high strain zone. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's this tiny little dot, and it's called the Shores Melange Study Area, and it's located in the seven islands of Virginia. Now, before we go deeper, um, what is the purpose of this? Why did I even do this? Um, well, the first thing is, is that we are utilizing the outcrops uh, exposed by the James River in order to research the shores blondes. This is a very, very unique opportunity as the James River reveals a lot of the bedrocks on its own. So we don't have to dig, we don't have to go through the soil, we don't have to go through the sediments. It's right there, ready for us and it's prime for us to pick it up. So we're gonna take this, we're gonna analyze these outcrops, collect some samples and if and take these to determine if this melange is truly the suture zone that it has been cited to be, the suture zone of the Taconian orogeny. And then after that, after the samples and analyze, anal, anal, excuse me, analysis, we will create a highly detailed map of this complex area on various scales and layers that has not been done before. Now, let's go ahead and talk about the fun we've done down by the river. So, of course, I keep talking about that this is in the river, this is in the river. Well, it's not like you can walk up to this stuff, so we have to take a canoe. And this was very on-the-spot training for me. I have never really been in open water, so this was fun for me on many different levels. And uh, so this first extravagance for me and canoeing. And you can see the James River it creates these nice little, you probably saw it in the drone image, these nice little white water, um, pretty low-class uh, rapids. And here's the canoe we took, one of the canoes we took. And you can see that it's just, you can see little um, 
rocks outcropping here. And then of course we have the tools, the general tools of the trade. We have a rock hammer that's used to collect all of the uh, rock samples. And of course we have a GPS, which is key to making a very accurate map and making sure our location is correct. And, as, and, um, and finally we have samples that we collected. And you can see my notes um, on the bottom of the screen as well. And they're taken in that bright orange notebook. And uh, this is quite important. And then we have a picture of a rootless fold here that I will talk about later. Now, this was by the river, and this was kind of on the larger um, scale of things. Let's talk about some smaller stuff. So when we took these samples in the lab, and we didn't just like look at them, we did a lot of things to them. The first thing we did was, this is a sample of a chloride epidote uh, rich greenstone. And what we did was took a saw and we cut these and it gave us a fresh face that's not, I wouldn't say corrupted, but kind of uh, distorted by the sediments and the uh, weathering and the erosion and all kinds of stuff that's happening to it in the chemical processes as well. And this is just a fresh, clean face. So now we can really see what's going on here and these beautiful bandings in this. Then some of these samples were lucky enough to get nicely polished. I polished these. And then after it was polished, we went ahead and put an acrylic layer over it. And this, what this does is that it keeps this wet look to the rocks, which gives it this color. And of course, I put it through Photoshop to kind of emphasize and be able to see in a, on a visual or on a virtual image, kind of what we see in our hands as well, which can be, it doesn't translate too well sometimes when you put it on a computer. So this is kind of an enhanced image. It's basically a glow up shot of the um, rock to the left. And then some of these rocks were even more fortunate become thin sections, well, parts of them become thin sections. And these say, one of, the, one of these thin sections right about here. And a smaller part of it is this right here. Now, it's not very green. This is in cross polarized light. And what you see here is really a big, a bit of a mess kind of, but it's, it tells a lot. It tells uh, very much a lot of detail here. There's, we have the feldspar and we have what well, we have epidote. And it doesn't really look like the pretty and the extravagance that epidote is. So this is kind of the version of it is kind of zoocyte. And um, this is on a um, micro level. So this is significantly smaller than the other images before. Now, take a breath here. So this is all small stuff. And I'm, here I am talking about that we made maps. So let's talk about the maps we made. Well. These weren't like scrap, I didn't make this from scrap. There was previous research done about this. And one of them was done by William Randall Brown in 1969. He mapped the Seven Islands of Virginia and the Shores Complex and the uh, Dillwyn 15 minute quadrangle. And it is on a, it's not on a very detailed scale. It's one to 60,500 scale. So you don't see like the niche kind of things. But the really big important thing to take away here is that there's this yellow blob right in the center. It's the James River. It's just alluvium. He just mapped out alluvium. And well, we found out that's not what's there. There's a lot to tell the James River reveals to us. And then of course we flash forward to 2010, uh, Carl Lang, a former graduate here, he was did the bedrock and also the surficial geologic map along the James River. And uh, his thesis was mostly fake as focused on the uh, superficial geology and not so much the bedrock, but this does give a good bedrock and a little bit more in depth. It's on a one to 12,000 scale. So we're getting closer into the detail we want, but still it's just this blankness in the James River it just doesn't quite do it justice, honestly. That's where we come in. So to start off, we have an um, aerial image from Google Earth of the uh, seven islands. And now the seven islands is in the name. It's seven islands that compose of, and there's this big island in the center and it's right where Shores, Virginia is. Now Shores basically no longer exists on the map unless you dig pretty deep. It used to be a railroad town and it's the CSX railroad that follows the James River all the way pretty far. It goes even towards Williamsburg. And uh, Shores unfortunately no longer exists much like a lot of railroad towns today. <clears throat> it still exists, but not in the same way it used to. And then let's clear it up just a little bit so you can get a better image of it. So we have the James River, we have the Big Island labeled, we have Shores labeled, and we also now have the uh, railroads a little clearly um, labeled as well. So this is still pretty blank. So let's go ahead and reveal part of the map that we worked on this the whole time. This is the bedrock of the uh, Shores Melange along the inside the James River. We still have some alluvium, but 
this is the detail we really want. This is what we want the James River to reveal to us. We have cleared up even more. So we have a lot going on here, don't we? We have uh, four main units that make up the uh, Shores Complex. We have the Chapawams to the east. And we also have a pretty large uh, Jurassic Dike that cuts across that uh, has been mapped plenty of times. And this is kind of just a reiteration of that. But there's these three main, and the fourth smaller one, but three main units here that we can um, talk about today. Now, the first unit was right about here, and we'll get some images of it. So this is described as a pinstriped meta gray wacky. It's kind of schistos, it's schistos in texture. It doesn't kind of go beyond the green, um, green schist facies of uh, grade metamorphism. Um, this one doesn't show it, but a lot of the other outcrops of the Metagray Wacky have abundance quartz stains and rootless folds. And it's important to note that the foliation is also dominantly dipping northwest. We'll get into that a little bit later. But right here in image A, we have a picture of a rootless fold in the wild, so to speak. It hasn't been, um, it hasn't been cut up. It hasn't been taken for a um, rock sample. And you can see that it's very, it's highly deformed right here. And then B is a sample of a rootless fold, and you can now see why it's called rootless. It's not really attached to much, it doesn't look like, thus rootless. Um, this is interesting because it's highly, highly deformed here. And the thing about what we're trying to figure out is if this was just a suture zone, high deformation is kind of like a high strain zone, but that doesn't mean there's no deformation in a suture zone as well. So it's important to note this high deformation kind of um, feature here. Now we'll return to the map and we'll look at two other um, outcrops real quick for the greenstone. <clears throat> and these are in fact greenstone, <clears throat> excuse me. So there's kind of like two flavors I wanna call them of greenstone. We have this generic looking greenstone and it's not so much boring as it is, you'll see in a second, but it's gray, I mean not gray, it's green and um, it has some light parts and there's like one really major fracture set, you know, fractures going on and there's a couple others too. So you have two, kind of directional fractures going on here. But when we look at this, this is a chloride epidote rich greenstone. There's a lot more going on here. And what we say, or what we interpret as this, is it's the same greenstone unit, but they look almost completely different. So of course it's still green, um, but this adds a lot more quartz veins in it. They're folded. You see a ton more fractures. So what exactly happened here? This gives us a little bit of insight to the deformation of what happened in the Shores Melange in the Shore Study area. Now, one last stop before we go on is kind of in the uh, coarse grained Schistos Nice. And this is now, the foliation is now dipping southeast. Directional change there. One of the really important parts of this is the big question of blocks or boudins. We have an image right here that we has been interpreted in previous literature as blocks, which are just these ultra uh, mafic to ultra mafic rocks that have been stuck in um, sedimentary rocks. And when they got there, so they turned into meta sediments. And it's a more competent, I would say, a more competent material than the sediments they were deposited in. And these blocks, sometimes they're angular, sometimes they're kind of rounded off like this. And then boudins are, of course, this other, another strong material surrounded by a, a less competent material and they get pinched off into like these little sausages and they elongate and they kind of follow each other. Now blocks are kind of sporadic, they're broken up and they're more associated with a true, like not a true melange, but a melange in that it's a suture zone. Whereas boudins, well, they're more indicative of a high strain zone, which is kind of interesting, but it's hard to tell if this is a block or boudin. Blocks and boudins can be separated Really, really far apart. So it's kind of, you can't just assume when you just make these observations firsthand. Now, the other mystery is the Luco granite. It's one of the big mysteries of the Shores Melange, what we have right here. You see, the Luco granite is this light, lighter colored um, rock that's kind of surrounded by this uh, Schistos Nice rock. And it's been cited before in previous literature as a block. That doesn't quite look like a block to me. So that's where we'll lead into the next step of this, where we get into these even more detailed maps. And they're even smaller when we zoom in. So right about here, we'll take a trip right there. So this is another drone image. Again, talk about, taken by Pablo Yanez. It's actually several images stitched together. 
And of course, north is at the top, which is very important. And um, we have a scale, I have a scale bar about two meters, so you see. And to give another sense of scale, we have some tiny trees, and we have some alluvial grasses here, and uh, sediments covering a lot of the rocks. And it's kind of, it's very wet because it was quite rainy that day, but again, it makes for fantastic pictures. And what are we actually seeing here? It's, it's a rock, that's cool, but let me clear it up a little bit. What we're looking at is two distinctly different rocks. One's a Lugo granite and one is the Schistos gneiss. And of course, this was interpreted when we were on the field or in the field on the ground looking at this. We took uh, measurements, we took fracture and foliation measurements. We kind of walked along these and plotted it on a paper map. And we took it home, well, I took it home and uh, drew this out on Illustrator to reveal what exactly is going on here. Well, let's go even further. Let's go ahead and take a cross section and do a cross, cross sectional analysis. There we are, it was a big reveal. This doesn't really look like a block that it's been sighted. This actually looks like an intrusion. It's no longer a block, which kind of makes you think even more. And then it has been deformed. In fact, it's been folded and it forms this nice, beautiful anticline. Okay, and now what we know is, is that this intrusion has to be younger, of course, because you can't intrude something that doesn't exist before. But when did this deformation actually happen? The grade of metamorphism doesn't quite match the uh, schistose nice around it. So was there a second deformation event that caused this leucogranite? Or was it all part of it and the leucogranite is just a more competent material? It's very interesting. So in the end, what we did, we got, got 42 stations, 15 hand samples, and five thin sections. We have 105 measurements that we eventually broke up into stereograms. And this is one example of that stereogram. It's pretty, uh, sometimes when we think of stereograms, we just think of the lines on the great circle. This is a little more complex. Now, this is a combination of uh, 56 uh, foliation planes measured around 42 stations. The majority, what's important to note is that the majority of the poles uh, cluster in the northwest area of the stereogram, while the rest are more spread out in the southeast area of the stereogram. This is kind of, it's just saying that the poles determine that the majority of the foliation planes dip to the southeast, while a smaller number dip to the southwest. And that's just an easier way to look at it than a bunch of lines on a, uh, on a stereogram. So this is, to go into more detail, is a, specifically a contoured stereogram of the pulse defoliation in the shore study area. What this does, it reveals a girdle distribution and that the, there's an asymmetrical folds, which just simply means that they're not even on each side. And of course, some, and even more is it's been contoured to two standard deviations to kind of give it a little bit of a cleaner look. And then Still, and then of course we made two maps on different scales and we plan to make a little bit more, but the real mystery remains. What makes this a suture zone and not a high strain zone? I keep talking about this and the suture zone is just the Teutonic orogeny and the high strain zone has been, there's a lot more deformation, a lot more strain. Um, well, the answer to that will come if you attend my uh, thesis presentation in May. So of course, we're not really done. We have future work here to do. The one big problem with 2020, well, we all know the problems of 2020, but this kind of added on to it. It was very wet. That makes it really hard to study in the river because, well, we can't have high river uh, levels. One, it makes it hard to canoe down. And two, it kind of covers the outcrops that we're trying to show. So as you can see, it's, after the, over the past 41 years is the yellow dots of the median of the daily statistic of the discharge level. So those blue lines are quite far above the, those ye uh, the yellow dots. And that's the big problem. We can't really do drone imagery and uh, walk along the outcrops that are covered in water. And the other future work is doing a chemical analysis and dating of this mysterious leucogranite. We kind of want to do the chemical analysis to see what exactly is the composition of this leucogranite. It's been cited as two different rocks and two different pieces of literature, one being tonalite and one being trongemite. Now it's kind of part of the same family. It's a tonalite trongemite granodiorite, 
uh, TTG. It's kind of a ternary diagram for any of you uh, that have taken rock forming minerals. We know what ternary diagrams are. And it really depends on the composition of the feldspar. Is it Na rich? Is it calcium rich? Or is it uh, potassium rich? This is key to understanding which exactly um, which exactly these fall into for the leucogranite. And of course, dating it will give us a cooling age. And this cooling age will allow us to understand when exactly this intrusion happened and when exactly possibly it deformed. It could be earlier or there could be a very young rock, which means there could have been a second deformation event that caused a lot of the um, features we see. So it's really interesting. It'll give us a clear insight to exactly what happened at this location. Okay, so that was my presentation. Thank you all so much for attending. It means so much to me when I give.